Well, I think if you were to, if someone was to properly look at the um, the works of like all the great Greek historians, Hippocrates, Herodotus, um, they'll see the influence that Africa had on Europe as a whole throughout the period of ancient Greece. Um, the ancient Egyptians used to have things called mystery schools or mystery systems where they ran from Sudan all the way up into parts of Turkey, Ionia, places like that. Um, and what used to happen there was people used to go and learn, or certain people, if they were lucky enough, used to go and learn a lot of the information, like the term, what the Egyptians used to have is the term Neo. So a Neo was known as a student, or a Neophyte was known as a student, somebody who would go and learn, but they'd learn orally. So, hence that's why Socrates never wrote anything down. Um, I think a lot of people know the fact that the term know thyself is attributed a lot of the time to Socrates, but in actual fact, if you go to certain temples um, in Egypt and in parts of uh, East Africa, you'll see the term inscribed, and it predates Socrates and any of those guys. So it goes to show you where he was getting he was getting taught. But for me, it just it it's prevalent throughout a lot of Greek history how the ancient Greeks how how revered the Ethiops, which meant of the burnt face, um, how revered they actually were. And over periods of time, it's become kind of, um, it's become kind of taboo to associate anything wise, knowledgeable, philosophical, intellectual with Africa. And that's what a lot of European historians and academics find hard to, uh, to digest, is the fact that these guys from Socrates to Plato, to Aristotle, to Herodotus, to Hippocrates, all these guys, they were taught or influenced by the teachings of black Africans, ancient Egyptians. So I think one of the fundamental reasons why Europeans uh, in general, the European intelligentsia, um, scholars and academics, why they deny Africa their history, you know, from ancient Egypt all the way through to kind of the major empires from Mali and, you know, and, and Kush and all those, those kind of things is because of the fact that if you accept that these groups of people were responsible for your ascent into history, your ascent into what is known as civilization, then how the hell can you justify enslaving them? And that's part of the problem, is the fact that you've enslaved, you've tortured, you've committed innumerable acts of genocide on the same people that put you in the position that you are in, scientifically, philosophically, academically, and culturally, and linguistically, whichever way you kind of want to look at it. Um, and that's one of the fundamental issues, is the fact that the idea of race and racism as an ideology is only 250 years old. It was only at the start of the 17th century where we really started to see a change in, in the way that humans regarded each other. So it's a very new idea. It's a very pernicious and sick idea that, that people find it very difficult to undo because the Greeks never had the concept for race, you know, race before the 17th century was a group of people that shared cultural, linguistic and geographical similarities, whereas once the uh, J.F. Blumenbachs and certain anthropologists, Charles Darwin and, and his kind of followers and descendants, once they got their hands on the idea of breaking humans down into certain groups, um, then it started to become more prevalent you had the phenotypic biological overview of what humans, who they are and what they constitute. And you know, obviously, you, you, you know, you've got the measuring of the skulls, cephalic in index, anthropometry, all these different sciences, pseudosciences were invented to try and put the white man up at the top and the African at the bottom. And this was all due to the fact that for hundreds of years before, Africa was the richest, most prosperous cultural hub or center point of the world, which is why Alexander decided, you know, when he went to Cairo, or when he went to Kemet, why he called it Alexandria. That is where everything that, you know, the library in Kemet there, there's thousands and thousands of books, it's been documented that he took from the library of Kemet 
back into Greece. Aristotle did the same thing. Alexander never went anywhere without Aristotle. And a lot of the information that was in those books was used and plagiarized by by Greek philosophers. And it's not I don't think it's a matter of trying to say, oh, you know, the uh, the Greeks weren't doing anything, and I don't think it's about that. I think it's more to do with who influenced who, you know. And people, if you, people don't look at Charles Darwin and say this guy came up with the theory of evolution completely on his own. He studied theories and schools of thought from kind of anthropology to sociology far back from his time, and that's what people don't realise. I was talking with my friend the other day and we were discussing how the idea of naming something after one person is really quite stupid, you know, the idea of something being Darwinian or Marxism, you know, like attributing one type of thinking to a certain man is very dangerous and illogical at the same time because everyone has read from someone, everybody studied another period or another part of of, of humanity or another part of history to get to where they are, including Marx. I mean, Africa and China had the idea of democratic sharing for thousands of years before Marx and Engels decided to sit down and, uh, and coin the term, you know, communism. What gave impetus to European development was the Moors and the role that they played from the 8th century through to the 12th century in, in Portugal and parts of Spain. You know, when they, when they came, they initially would have brought with them language, they would have brought culture, they would have brought philosophy, they would have brought um, music. All these different factors were responsible, and architecture as well, you know, the way that they built things, the way they designed things. Um, the abacus, that's from the Moors, um, the guitar, that's from the Moors, uh, score writing, music, all, all these kind of things were never before they've been introduced in, into Europe. It's actually funnily enough also that the 8th century was the first period in European history where we start seeing a black-white dichotomy playing out against itself. So before that, there is no real documentation of white racism towards black people. What we started seeing in, through the period of the Moors was white people actually turning around and trying to say that these black Africans, these black Arabs, are oppressors, they're colonialists, they're this, they're that. And that's what gave birth to the, to the first initial spree of kind of white supremacy or white racism. Um, and then obviously as, as time played on, that became more consecrated within people's thinking and, and it started to pervert the way they, they regarded one another. But also, the Moors never really, as far as colonial powers go, they didn't knock down any churches. They let the Spanish and the Portuguese continue to practice Christianity. But they just said that, you know, the dominating religion is going to be Islam. But you guys can keep your churches and you can, you know, we're not going to knock anything down, which is complete opposite to what Europeans did when they went anywhere and there was a mosque or, you know, there was a temple. They they knocked it down, they bombed it. Um, or they just, they just destroyed it or they, they kind of outlawed any other religion apart from Christianity. So, yeah, I think the Moors played a, a really crucial, vital, pinnacle role in... European development um, and like we were talking about earlier it was a uh, you know the Chinese invented gunpowder but it was an Arab artisan in 1304 that actually created the first real mechanism to fire bullets to fire pistols and it was the northern Europeans who got hold of that technology around the 13th century 14th century and started to use it as a as a weapon of dominance um, and to suit their own kind of political and military needs, but it was never used that aggressively by the groups of people. It had been used before, um, but not to the extent in which kind of the British were using it on the Irish, on the, on the Welsh and the Scottish.